Coming up on Nebraska Stories, a rock collection like no other. Artful canines created for a noble cause. Omaha singer-songwriter Jocelyn. And the restoration of a Cold War warrior. Sometimes when you love something, you just can't get enough of it. You show us everything you've got. For Dennis Mahosky of York, that something is the hard-driving rock band Kiss. We'll drive you crazy. He saw the makeup-wearing, fire-breathing rockers in concert for the first time when he was about 12 years old. Everybody's favorite song is rock and roll all night. After I had seen them on stage, they, uh, they just totally blew my mind, changed my life, I mean forever. It was just so amazing that uh, I don't even know how to explain it. What he couldn't put into words, he put into a collection that now takes up much of his own. First thing that I collected was my ticket stub, actually, because um, I still have it. I remember holding on to that going into the show. I kept that and cherished it forever and ever and ever. That ticket stub got him in the door to the concert and opened the door to a lifetime of collecting KISS memorabilia. There's leather jackets and lunch boxes, even bags of confetti that fell to the floor following KISS concerts. I'm looking at uh, perfumes. Neckties, a lot of clothing, any kind of clothing item that you can think of. Guitar strings, um, they come out with their own pop now. Uh, guitar picks is a big one for me. They even got a toothbrush. Many times he buys two of an item, one to keep sealed in the box it came in and another to open and enjoy. Then there's the guitars. And this is my favorite guitar. This is the signed to Dennis um, from Ace Frehley right there. And I got this at Rock and Roll Vance Camp. And um, uh, it means a lot to me. Yes, Dennis spent a week at Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp playing drums and meeting some music legends, including Ace Frehley from Kiss. For a week in California, he lived like a rock star. Back in Nebraska, though, his KISS collection has brought him his own fame. People still called me the KISS fan, you know, the KISS guy. Uh, I remember walking in Lincoln uh, one time, and this guy had just stopped dead cold and said, you're, you're the KISS guy, aren't you? And, and pointed out to his son, you know, this is the guy that everybody talks about. And the little boy, his eyes just lit up like was, he seen a rock star or something, you know? And I was just, it, after I walked away, I realized and it made me feel good because I was, that was pretty neat. The same kind of feeling he gets watching Kiss take the stage. If you could rate the fans of this rock band, Dennis would be off the charts. Oh, there's, there's a lot of crazies out there, but I, I think I'm up there. But I'm not, not a KISS freak. I'm a KISS fan. A fan who's living his own real life rock and roll fantasy. One KISS collectible at a time. I'd like to have my own KISS museum someday. It's where I can sit down and just um, open open things up to people and share. It's, it's so cool to watch somebody um, come over here and 
open up the curtain and come down here and just go, oh, wow, that's amazing. When a camera crew shows up on your front yard on a hot day in July, it can attract a lot of attention. Here comes another one. <laughs> but it's not really the crew that's turning heads. It's a pack of 25 colorful fiberglass dogs. These positive, wonderful hounds are the dog children of Joe Maber. We got the idea to do Paws on the Plat community art by seeing sculptures in different communities, different cities, such as Lincoln's hearts and things. And I thought, I really want to look into that. Joe is doggedly determined to find the perfect way to raise money for the cause that's close to her heart. We are an organization of volunteers that works to improve the lives of cats and dogs in the North Platte area. We do that by providing low-income spay-neuter services, by emergency veterinary care, working to educate pet owners on responsible pet care. As president of Positive Partners, Jo collaborated with her team and came up with a charitable event that combined local businesses and artists with animal lovers. There's a lot of talented artists in North Platte, and we decided that we would ask if any would like to volunteer to paint dogs for our project. Of the people that we asked, not a single one turned us down and said they would love to. Pause on the Platte Community Art Project was born. The concept was simple. A business sponsors a fiberglass dog, a selected local artist paints it, and then the finished piece goes up for public auction. I love Jo because she is just as excited and passionate about these dogs as we are, and she loves every dog. Like, she won't pick a favorite, but every dog is very special to her, and for that, how could you not get excited? Business owner and artist Jeff Codwell incorporated scenes of North Platte on his dog he named Sprocket. For one, I'm a dog lover, and two, I am a big bike rider and when I ride my bike I wanted to know like where do I ride in North Platte what do I like to see and I love the old buildings downtown which is why Paramount and the Fox Theater is on here um, you have the Pawnee Scouts Rest Ranch the railroad the spike Cody Park I mean all these are great places where you can ride your bike and and check out and I just thought I'd incorporate that on Sprocket my mom passed away during this, so I had a struggle for a while trying to figure out what I was going to do, and she was proud of North Platte, so that is kind of why this has a lot of me and, and my mom and, and my family in this, so you do grow fond of them. Um, it is fun, and we just like bringing in smiles to everybody's faces, so that's how we came up with them. Body piercer and apprentice tattoo artist Mariah Spronk grew up around animals. She and a group of fellow tattoo artists painted Lloyd. So Lloyd's wearing his little dapper vest with his sweet little glasses and he's got this beautiful little helix piercing over here and it just kind of ties in with that old school tattoo shop vibe. The quality of the artistry is just phenomenal. We have some artists that this was their first project that, to do anything like this. We have some that were very seasoned and actually have artwork around the United States and even overseas. Tara Linneman was inspired by the bold decorative colors found in Hispanic art when she painted Dante Coco Loco. I decided to paint it in the aspect of the Mexican traditional folk art. It's a really neat technique to decorate their spirit animal characters. I just thought it was a really cool design to do for this dog. When you see all the dogs together especially, it's just a little overwhelming to the senses because of the quality 
of the artwork, the variety, the different themes. People have been in awe of it and really support what we've done. I wanted to be a part of this project because I, I have a real passion for animals and I know that the funds for these auctions are going to just go to a really great program. The Positive Partners have done so many amazing things for our community. Like so many other dogs and cats who found their forever homes through the good works of Positive Partners and the North Platte Animal Shelter, Sprocket and his 24 other pals have now found their forever homes in the communities across Nebraska. In North Platte, it seems every dog does indeed have its day. Mess it up. <laughs> All right. They just come to me when I feel something that I went through or something that I haven't let go of yet. It will take a hold of me and I'll need to do something about it. And then I write about it or I express it. I just grab my guitar. I'll hear a melody in my head. If it sticks, I'll keep it and I'll record it on my cell phone. As I'm creating it, I'm writing words that I feel. Yeah, yeah, no matter. Acoustic pop, a little bit of hip hop, a little bit of alternative indie. I feel like there's a little bit of jazz, R&B. Just keep going as it comes to me. <laughs> keep performing, playing shows, getting better at performing uh, my album, and hoping to change lives with the music. You were the one. I love performing for people and making their day just a little bit brighter. And I know music can do that. It does it for me. I was going through a very hard time, kind of not being able to accept myself. Uh, I feel like now I'm finally in there. I just wanted to be perfect all the time. A social media definitely made me feel that way, that I needed to be that way. It can consume your brain, your mind, your confidence, and make you feel like you are nothing. And we have to remember that we are not the internet. <laughs> we are human beings with real life, lives to live. Um, and we have to make the best of it because we only have this life. I've just been going to schools. It's to help the kids accept where they are now and how to deal with it in a positive way. How to deal with it so they can grow from the outcome and become a better person and build character. My hopes are to get this positive music out there to the kids. Let them know like, hey, this is an awkward stage, but guess what, it's not gonna last forever. And you can do something about it right now. Find something that you love and start learning about it. Still I want you to know when you come back home that things won't be the same as they were yesterday. We forget to not always think the same as other people. We don't always need to be in the same mindset. It just doesn't have to be that way. The one thing we should all agree on is all being able to think differently and being okay with that and trying to understand one another. This time is the last time, I swear. This time is the last. Gonna turn the page on all my yesterdays and write my own path. And if I wake up feeling like the sun has lost its shine, I'm gonna throw my head up and rewrite every line. Damn, you look so beautiful. You're far beyond the usual. And baby, don't forget. You're not an accident. You light up every room you walk in. All the hearts you touch start falling. No one will forget. Everywhere you've been, I'm going to write a love letter to myself. You're going to hear it, hear it. Love letter to myself. You're going to hear it. 
right now. Na 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 yeah. Na 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 yeah. Na 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 yeah. Na 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 yeah. This world they will doubt you. I swear, pick you up just to knock you down. Nobody's ever bulletproof if you learned a lesson you didn't lose. And if I wake up. Feeling like my soul has lost its shine. I'm gonna throw my head up and rewrite every line. Damn, you look so beautiful. You're far beyond the usual. And baby, don't forget, you're not an accident. You light up every room you walk in. All the hearts you touch start falling. I'm gonna write a love letter to myself You're gonna hear it, hear it Love letter to myself You're gonna hear it right now Don't give up, don't give up Don't give up on me Don't give up, don't give up Don't give up on me Don't give up, don't give up don't give up on me I'll write it a permitted ink, yeah Damn, you look so beautiful You're far beyond the usual And baby, don't forget You're not an accident You light up every room you walk in All the hearts you touch start falling No one will I'm gonna write a love letter to myself So beautiful Yeah Don't forget, babe I'm gonna write a love letter to myself You're gonna hear it, hear it Love letter to myself you're gonna hear it right now. This is your uh, battle staff area. When you can see right here, it's cut. It's there, it's there, it's there. It's everywhere. Mark Hamilton has been restoring aircraft at the Strategic Air and Space Museum in Ashland for more than two decades. The B-29 Superfortress, the C-47 Skytrain, and now this one, the EC-135 Looking Glass. Some stuff is so deteriorated that you have to paint it. There's mold. This stuff's going to have to come out. This piece, there's a, a nut plate that fits up here where that screw went. That piece is all corroded off. This is the largest and perhaps the most important restoration project to date for the museum. Expected to cost at least 200000 fundraising efforts have garnered about half that much so far. Just think of the copper that's up there. We're going to take all that copper out and sell it. <laughs> Leading the effort to restore this aircraft are two men who spent years working aboard the plane. This was the heart of the operation. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, week after week, month after month, year after year. I mean, this was, this was, this was the, the, the heartbeat. This part of the airplane is referred to as the battle staff area. And this would be the chair right here that the general sat in, this chair right here. Retired four-star General John Chain is the former commander of the Strategic Air Command at Offutt Air Force Base in Bellevue. He and former Emergency Action Team Officer Al Buckles want others to know the role this plane played in helping the U.S. win a war it never had to fight. It was airborne 24 hours a day, seven days a week for many, many years. 
And if, if we were ever, as a country, under attack, nuclear, particularly with nuclear weapons, uh, we had a command post that could operate and be able to uh, control and make sure that the missiles that we had when the President of the United States made the decision, uh, we would be able to launch them. For nearly three decades, beginning in 1961, at the height of U.S. and Soviet Cold War tensions, Strategic Air Command operated airborne command posts, codenamed Looking Glass, for its ability to mirror the nuclear command and control functions underground at Offutt. They never come to the general to say, may, may I go do this? They just knew their job had to be done this, and they right. did that, OK? General Chain never got the call to launch from the president. But it was a responsibility he was ready to execute at any time. We were so strong and so well prepared, they have to know that we would retaliate. And it would be a terrible retaliation. I mean, we would, we would eliminate them, basically. There were a number of looking glass aircraft built, but this will be the only one on display in the world. The general was at the helm for the final mission. The biggest memory is the quality of the crews flying the airplane and the battle staff. They were a band of brothers and sisters. They uh, knew what they were doing and the importance of the mission, and they did it extremely well. It was once a state-of-the-art aircraft, walls lined with the latest in electronic equipment, high-tech wiring and control panels, and manned by a highly trained elite crew. In 1990, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the continuous airborne mission ended, and the looking glass was put on ground alert status. It was the end of an era, as newer technologies and efficiencies replaced this relic of the Cold War. For many, the looking glass is an icon of peace, but the aircraft's current state belies its historical significance. Now, much of the plane has been tagged and stripped. Bare walls expose rotted insulation and corroded panels. Every instrument, from cockpit to tail, is being restored and reinstalled. After deteriorating outside for nearly two decades, this EC-135 jet, also known as the Doomsday Plane, is inside a hangar at the museum, wings clipped, and more than halfway through a five-year restoration project. I knew this one was going to be a lot of work. The aircraft had never been sealed. It had a lot of openings in it. When it sat out there, the right side of the aircraft was facing on the west side of it. So all the snow and came and it formed them barnacles. And so I was out there uh, killing wasps and plugging holes. And there was damage on this panel. So I had him remove this panel. And then we found bird nest. And that was the same underneath, but it was like a bale of hay coming out. For the past couple of years, Hamilton has been working with a rotating crew of volunteers to bring this iconic warhorse back to its appearance during the height of the Cold War. Good. All right. A number of the volunteers have a personal stake in the restoration. I was uh, flying the uh, looking glass from uh, 1978 to 1982. I was a communications officer and airborne launch control systems officer. I knew what it was when it first came out here, and then I saw the deterioration, and it made me feel upset. I pulled my old chair out and uh, put it in storage, and I, I pulled my console out, and it, it's in storage, and I, I cleaned that down to the metal. So uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the time when we start putting the components back in. Volunteer Steve Stevens piloted the looking glass and flew 18 missions on this very plane. You look at the airplane and you say, you know, I flew that beauty. You live in the past, I guess is the best way to call it. And uh, I thought it was a good project. I needed, you know, I'm retired. I had plenty of time, so it, it's a lot of memories. The goal is to create a walkable museum display inside the aircraft. Looking back, I had a strong sense of pride 
of being part of the Strategic Air Command and uh, knowing what we were doing and uh, knowing that it, uh, what it meant to the country. Uh, it made a lot of the hardships bearable. I certainly want people to understand what we did. It'll be there for history for my kids, grandkids, to see what uh, Strategic Air Command was. Uh, a lot of people nowadays don't really remember that. We told the world, mainly the Soviet Union, that we would keep it up there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for years. And we always had the capability of taking over command of the nuclear forces. People can look at it and say, that won the Cold War. It didn't go to the boneyard and get chopped up and melted. It's, good. it's history, you know. Uh, it won the Cold War. Watch more Nebraska Stories on our website, Facebook, and YouTube. Nebraska Stories is funded in part by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation.